Greetings, everybody. This is Chris Hisla from the Montana World Affairs Council. I'd like to thank Marcy and all her colleagues at the Missoula Community Foundation for having us here today, and thank you for joining us. I'm going to briefly introduce this panel of nonprofit and community leaders, and then we're going to have a short video from General Wesley Clark. To my immediate right is good friend Mary Poole from Soft Landing, Missoula. Next to her is Jacqueline Flewellen from the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center. And finally, here is Robert Rivers from Imagination Brewing. So welcome to the panel. We'll come back with some Q&A after the following. We uh, were very fortunate to have General Wesley Clark, who is the former Supreme Allied Commander NATO and presidential candidate, uh, send us a video. Uh, General Clark is now also the head of a nonprofit called Renew America Together. And the focus of his nonprofit is actually on civil dialogue, which is the focus of our discussion today. So uh, join us in watching a short video with General Wesley Clark. Um, I'm retired General Wes Clark, Little Rock, Arkansas. And I want to thank the Missoula Community Foundation and the Montana World Affairs Council for inviting me to this panel. Unfortunately, I can't be there or with you in person, but but I do want to say a few words in introduction, if you'll permit me. Look, this country is coming apart at the seams, really. I mean, I talk to people all over the world and they say, what's happened to America? And what's happened simply is that there are a lot of different opinions in America. There have always been a lot of different opinions in America. It's the way our country is, and we're proud of it. It's that diversity of opinions that, that gives us the, the stuff to make a really great nation. And so um, in what we're doing today in Montana and what we're trying to produce some from one of my organizations all across the country is a better civic dialogue. And we know this is the key for a great democracy. The government works for us. It does what we tell it to do through elected representatives. We have mayors, we have county commissioners, we have governors, we have senators, congressmen, we have a president. All is, everybody's elected democratically and they're all representing you and me and the rest of us out here. But question is, what is it that we want them to do? Um, we've all got our own ideas. Some of us have one area of expertise, know a lot about it. It may be about ranching or farming. Uh, maybe about foreign affairs. It may be about real estate. Somehow all those different ideas, all of us have ideas about family and our how we want to grow up, and how we want our kids and grandkids to grow up, but all those ideas have to be brought together. They have to be brought together starting with the foundation of the facts, and the facts are always in debate. So we talk about the facts. But even more from a foundation of respect for our fellow Americans. So it doesn't matter whether you're on the left, the right, the middle, or don't know where you are in a political spectrum. Every person is entitled to respect for their opinion and to the uh, right to participate in the dialogue. And so in this panel today, uh, where we're talking about civic discourse, and how to have a civil dialogue. I hope we'll start with the principles of let's get to the facts. Let's respect each other. Let's look for ways to create win-win solutions. The great thing about America is it's built on an economic foundation of free enterprise. And that means that we want everybody to benefit. And if it's about your interests and my interests, commercial interests, financial interests, family interests, Normally, we can compromise on those. Um, if it's just about values, that's a tougher issue. But the basic values that we have to believe on in, in America are we respect each other. We respect the right of each person to choose his own or her own religious faith, have their convictions, have the courage of their convictions, but to respect others' choices as well. If we start with mutual respect, go after the facts, have a reasoned dialogue and look for compromise, we can't lose. We're, we'll be a self-correcting engine of progress, not only for America, but for the world. And that's what we've been for almost 250 years. 
And that's the way we want to go forward. When I look at what's happening in Russia, China, other autocratic systems, they don't correct themselves. They don't respect the people's opinions. And they don't listen to them. They don't have any mechanism for bringing it forward. Well, we do at the ballot box, in our elections, in our schools, in our day-to-day dialogue and community centers and clubs. We can do this and we respect each other. We can't lose. This is the model for mankind, but we have to not only talk it, but we have to live it. So good luck on the panel. Um, I'm going to be in Missoula next week and look forward to seeing many of you, I hope then. Thank you. Welcome back. This is Chris Hislop from the Montana World Affairs Council, and you're watching a panel discussion on civil dialogue on with Missoula Gives. Now, we'd like to thank General Wesley Clark, whom you just saw, who is the leader of his own nonprofit called Renew America Together, whose focus is, in fact, civil dialogue. So with our panel here, we'd like to kick it off by trying to understand exactly what are we talking about when we say civil dialogue. So I'm going to ask our panelists here to introduce themselves briefly and then answer the question, you know, what is civil dialogue within your organizations and how does this align with your work and your goals? Over to you, Mary. Thanks, Chris. Um, thank you, Missoula Gibbs. Thanks for having me here on this panel. Um, I'm Mary Poole. I'm the executive director of Soft Landing Missoula. And we have been an organization in Missoula now for about six and a half years, um, doing our part to welcome refugees to our city and um, provide supportive services and community education. So, um, civil dialogue, you know, to me, I think is actually kind of a misleading term. I'm going to throw that mm -hmm. in there right away. <laughs> um, for me, it really means listening, a lot of listening, um, first and foremost, listening and learning, um, and kind of taking ego out of the equation. Those would be my first thoughts. So. Cool. Thanks, Mary. I'm Jacqueline Flewellen, uh, the executive director of the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center. We have been in Missoula for 35 years, almost 36. Uh, you might know us by the big peace sign, which if you haven't come to check out, please do. It's behind our building over on Higgins Street. Um, we have a fair trade store in the front, too, where you can ethically purchase something and feel good about it. Um, and, and over the years, we've done a lot of different things in the community around social justice and nonviolence, environmental sustainability. Um, there are a ton of hats that volunteers and community members have filled at our organization. Um, and we're, we're grateful to be here and for the Missoula Community Foundation to put on events such like this. Um, I do have to say I'm a little jealous. Josh Slotnick was drinking and cooking in the kitchen for his live stream <laughs> and Robert has beer in his bag. Um, but hasn't shared the Bumblebee beer yet, maybe for a five o'clock later today. Um, but overall, I think um, civil dialogue, you know, I, I bring a really interesting background to the word civil dialogue. So I studied in a master's program, a global studies program, where we took international relations classes from local leading professors and premier universities in Germany, in Argentina, and India. And all three of those international relations classes were very different. They might have had the same foundation around game theory and NATO and multilateral agreements versus unilateral agreements and the conflicts of war and economy and extractive industries changing what civil dialogue looks like or the access to civil dialogue on an international level. Um, so I, I, I feel a little torn to describe what civil dialogue in Missoula looks like, um, just because I think it has such an international lens embedded into it as, as a concept. Um, and, and so that piece I don't want to forget as well is that, you know, defining civil dialogue in a majority white demographic in rural U.S. is, is a very different conversation than what civil dialogue looks like on the international scale. Um, so that, that's one piece. And, um, I think in, in the ways that we enact it or engage with civil dialogue in our organization takes a lot of different forms. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll talk in more specific about that a little bit later, but I wanted to add that, that piece to it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, um, 
thank you to all of you. I'm really looking forward to this time together and to Missoula Gives and Marcy and the crew. Uh, my name is Robert Rivers. I'm along with my wife, Fernanda, the co-founder of Imagination Brewing here in Missoula. Uh, seven years ago, we set out to create, a, a, I guess, a new vehicle for craft beer by setting up a microbrewery with the Center for Community Transformation. And so in the past seven years, we've uh, hosted over 4,000 community events and worked alongside 500 different uh, local organizations to really, I think, try to push forward uh, a positive agenda that can um, constructively impact all the people in Missoula. Um, my background coming into this is that I'm a peacebuilding specialist. I worked in conflict zones with people affected by violence and uh, specifically civilian peacekeepers for about 12 years in, in 11 different conflict zones. Um, and so uh, civil dialogue, you know, one of my favorite books uh, that I've ever read is from the nuclear physicist, uh, the British doctor, David Bohm, who wrote a book called On Dialogue. Mm -hmm. And in there, he references the Greek roots of the word dialogue is dialogos, which means through the word. And I loved what he talked about because he said, I think that if we come into to a conversation or a dialogue, already rooted in our own points of view, we're not going to get anywhere. But what makes dialogue magical is if people can come in with an openness to each other, to saying that maybe by talking together, like we're doing right now, hopefully we'll arrive at a point that is unknown to all of us right now, but that transcends our own ideas of what we think is right mm -hmm. or wrong or good or bad. And so I, I think for me, dialogue always has to have that component of, we want to arrive at a space together that is unknown. And I think if people can engage in that, not only is it more constructive, it's incredibly life-giving, I think. And so for me, I would say, for me, the civil dialogue is, is an adventure into the unknown. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. I love that so much. So we, we, yes, we are really teeing up for an interesting conversation <laughs> with these three people who come from really interesting backgrounds, though. And, and it's great because we're going to get different facets of this. So, uh, Robert, I'm going to come right back to you now on, on that. Um, General Clark, um, his comments were largely focused on the American political dialogue, mm -hmm. if you will, right now, or dual monologue, yep. however you want to describe that. Yep. Um, but what he uh, talked about as the foundation for this was facts and respect. Mm -hmm. um, just from your, from your past as a conflict mediation person and mm -hmm. here in Missoula, is, does that cover it when when we talk about civil dialogue and mm. civility in our in our communications? Um, if is the foundation of facts and respect enough? You talk about openness. Is there anything missing in what Clark says? Yeah, I love it that you said dual monologue mm -hmm. because I think for me, the actual root of uh, of of true civil dialogue, actually I think goes it, 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 the foundation to the respect for me, I think comes on at a consciousness level. And I think that much of Western society is founded on the philosophy of dualism, which is breaking the complexity of life into just two options. And what oftentimes follows that is Manichaeistic thought, which is not only are you taking the two, but one becomes good mm -hmm. and one becomes evil. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, the roots of dialogue go in order to like, I think, have respect for the person sitting across from you, you have to come from a consciousness level that sees the humanity before the political views. Mm -hmm. It's hard to have respect for somebody if you look at them and say, I know that 95% of how we think is different. You, you'll never get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, the consciousness is how do we complexify the dualism? That it's not just Mary or and myself. It's, okay, Mary is a mother. That's something I can relate to. Mary's a sister. That's something I can relate to. To be able to find the, the, the human values or the human, I think, the identities that are deeper than just what somebody's political view is. And so for me, honestly, I think it, it, it goes back to being able to see the other as, as, as a human being, not simply as the other. And I think if you can do that, and what I've seen in many conflict zones around the world is you can sit across the table I think like I have one time in the Philippines with a man who shared with me that he had been responsible for orchestrating the torture and murders of over 250 people. I took a big breath. I thought in my mind, all the bells are going off of like bad, evil, mm -hmm. this is terrible. 
And I sat and took a breath and I said, why did you do that? And then he explained to me that for his entire life, he had seen all of his people being persecuted and oppressed by the government of the Philippines. And so through that dialogue with him, I was able to arrive at a point where I'm not legitimizing that he tortured and killed 250 people, but I could understand why he did it. And by understanding why he did it, I could connect to his own humanity and we were able to sit and hold space together. Mm. Um, and so I think, I think for me, it's being able to see that humanity and break down the us versus them and good versus bad to being mm. you're a human being, <clears throat> I'm a human being, and where can we connect in that humanity, mm. even if there's a million things that we disagree on. And I'll bet you, the viewer, didn't realize we were going to get deep into theology and philosophy here today. So, you know, it, it, but, but I'm glad you, you asked the question. Those. Absolutely right. Now, I'm glad you did that. I, what I want to ask and now, Mary, this one's going to come to you, um, because what Robert said, I think, is interesting in that when I hear you say that, Robert, um, and when I hear General Clark speak, I doubt that anyone would firmly disagree with what you said. The idea of openness, the idea of respect, these things, you know, hardly anybody's going to say, no, I think we should be disagreeable. No, I think we should be dis yeah. it, It's not, so, so taking these ideas, you still have to put them into action mm -hmm. somehow. And mm -hmm. that's what you do in this community, right? You, you take these ideas and you put them into action in your work and in your programs. So Mary, I, this, this would be to you just, the kind of challenges you might face in that transition from, yes, we all agree to these great ideas, to the reality of now we have to use these ideas in order to deliver the things that we're trying to do. Yeah, so, I mean, just in building off of what Robert said too, I, I do wholeheartedly agree that it is recognizing and acknowledging shared humanity with who we're interacting with, whether that's staff, clients, people who do or don't agree, agree with what we're doing. Um, I think a lot of it too does come down to this idea that General Clark is bringing to the table of openness um, and realizing that it's just our job to leave the door open, mm. right? Like it's not necessarily my job to go in, in my place of ego and say, I'm going to change someone's mind, but it's my job to make sure that door doesn't close. Um, and to do that in a way where we're recognizing shared humanity, where we're understanding our values through storytelling and allowing the other pe person to tell their story to you in order that you find that shared humanity. And that door stays like this and respect is built. Respect mm. that wasn't there in the beginning is built. The world then comes behind you mm -hmm. and creates the relationships that need to be built. It's not necessarily your job in the forefront to say, I will make you agree with me and I will make you like this person and believe this and do this. But it's my job just to make sure that door doesn't shut so that the world then can come behind and do its work. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what you say there, Mary, it, it just strikes me as um, it, when we are talking about the current situation in American society and this very the, the polemic and the very difficult dialogue we're having, we sometimes assume that our superior logic can overwhelm mm. somebody else and say, you know, see, mm. I'm telling you the way it is mm -hmm. and therefore yep. it is that way. Um, but without, you know, as Robert said, openness and Mary, it's a, it's a great analogy kind of keeping the door open so that we can have space for these kinds of, of dialogues. Now, Jacqueline, I'd like to go to you uh, mm -hmm. on this, just also as a follow-up and looking um, the work of the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center here in the community and across mm -hmm. Montana. It's, it's very interesting, and, and this is really at the core of what you do. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about um, the challenges that you face in your program when you have to actually practice mm -hmm. civil dialogue? Yeah, totally. I mean, I, so I, I brought some facts. <laughs> which I think the general will enjoy me starting with. So, <laughs> I'm just going to frame, because I think for the Peace Center at this current moment, this is the most challenging conversations mm -hmm. that we're having with our members, with the community. And, and what I mean by challenging is, is, is uncomfortable, is, is tough, is requiring of self-reflection and openness and, and, and assessing things that haven't been done in the past or have have hurt or harmed other people. And that's that's really tough, right? So like in this 
conversation of civil dialogue. Like I loved your example, Robert, where there's humanity in both, right? But it requires a really deep listening to the experience of the person across from you to know where their pain is coming from. And I, and I want to just, I mean, yesterday, May 5th, um, missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, relatives, Two-Spirit folks yesterday. Um, I hope some of you attended, went to the Oval, um, where you go to the Indigenous Film Festival this weekend. There was an art show as well. And I just, I just want to start with some of those facts because I think they're incredibly important to the dialogue that's happening in Missoula and specifically at the Peace Center. So Indigenous women are 10 times more likely to be murdered than the national average woman, 10 times more likely. Homicide is the third highest case of death for girls between the ages of 10 and 24 years old for indigenous women. The oil boom, extractive economies and climate change are all wrapped into the MMIR, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives Movement. Um, we are sitting on stolen land that was taken brutally 500 years ago that was then written into law and legislation so when when we talk about civil dialogue and in the u.s context i don't see how it could not include the indigenous perspective and and for so many centuries i really feel like it hasn't um and there's this line that i that i read on this instagram post yesterday that said Ending the crisis of missing, murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people requires ending the era of fossil fuels. Um, and I really think there's something in that, that this, this core of oil and colonization and capitalism have continued for centuries to violate the rights of the people whose land this is. Um, and so for me, locally, our civil dialogue at the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center must include that, needs to include that. And we've been doing um, some really great work. We're just at the beginning. Um, and and it's it's a little, you know, we're, we're pushing up against some edges. There are some people that are a little uncomfortable with it that think, oh, you know, Jacqueline's coming in and saying Jeanette Rankin's bad. Um, well, she voted for the white women's vote fact, you know, that that we can we can have this dialogue and also move into today's world where we're talking about representation and with indigenous women having a 10 times higher rate of murder than any other demographic, that should be a topic of conversation. We're in Montana. Mm. This is happening here in our state. The extractive economies on the reservations, this, this is happening here. One of our board members, two of their relatives have gone missing in the past two months, two. I, like it, it, and so even though it's uncomfortable and, and hard to accept, I think creating more accessible spaces, like art spaces, creating more community programs, supporting all nations, supporting the human trafficking task force, supporting the organizations that are already on the ground doing this work, uplifting them um, and talking with our own boards talking with our own members, talking with those people that come in the store and are like, well, why are you focusing on this? Um, because we need to, even if it's something we haven't done historically. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot, Jacqueline, for also bringing in that perspective. It's a really important part of this discussion. And I think it, not just listening to whether it is a native community or other communities that we are all a part of or touching, that we're not just listening, but we're learning from, actually. We have a lot to learn from everybody in our community. So um, I'm sure we're going to swing back on that one. Um, but what I wanted to take um, just a little bit of what you said um, there, and I'm going to put this to all three of you, this next question. Robert, I'll start with you. Um, but. Uh, there is, we can generally agree, and we have some ways of, of doing this in our work, but to what end are we doing this exactly? You know, mm. um, just looking at your own work and in your own organizations, to what end do you see this kind of civil and respectful dialogue? I mean, past the kind of obvious or the self-evident end of this, of, of you know, having good relations, but there must be something that maybe you're, you're trying to achieve um, whether that's difficult or easy, I, I don't know. But Robert, mm. can you say a few words on that? 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jacqueline, for bringing in, I think, the like voices that have been marginalized by the mainstream of our society. I think unless we do that, then there's no sustainable peace, mm -hmm. right? Um, I guess for me, uh, you know, if, if you go in the brewery, you know, oftentimes people go in, first thing you do is order a beer, but above the beer list, we have a big sign that says, we are because of each other. Mm -hmm. It's the Bantu philosophy from the people of East and Southern Africa. Um, and I think for me, that is the end goal for me, that we can live in a world where we are because of each other, that we can look at each other and say, I am because you are who you are. You are because of, because of me. Um, and I think, you know, to, in order to do that, I, I was thinking as you were talking, uh, there, there's a time I did a training in, in, in South Sudan for civilian peacekeepers, I got off the plane and talked to the organization and, and they said, well, we've kind of got a doozy for you this year. And I said, what's going on? I said, well, you're going to be training people and in, in this group will be three different tribes who are killing each other right now in one part of the country and they hate each other. And this is going to be the first time that they're ever in a space together. So I thought, all right, deep breath. And I sat down and you know, gathered the group and they all sat in, the, in, their, in their tribes. Um, and it was extremely tense. And we had to talk through a lot of the reasons of why the killing was happening and why the division in the tribes. And I think what we found is by simply sharing a safe space, leaving that door open, as you say, I think what we were able to find is after 10 days, all of a sudden people start sitting intertribally. And at the end of it, I had one guy stand up and he said, you know, I didn't think that it was possible to actually get along with somebody from this other tribe, much less look at them and say, we're on the same team. Mm -hmm. And I think that simply by sitting in the discomfort, as you talk mm -hmm. about, with people that have different viewpoints or people that the structures of our society are affecting differently, mm -hmm. some are being propped up. Others are being significantly put down, but to be able to listen to those stories and be able to share that humanity that at some point we can say, if we're going to get somewhere together, there has to be other identities that we can share, that we can have many identities that are different, but ultimately I believe that we are because of each other. I, I truly believe that. And so for me, I think that to share that space and create safe space so people can have these conversations for me is that we can arrive at a place where we acknowledge, and really believe deep down that we are because of each other. And I think when we do that, then we start to look at each other differently mm -hmm. and we start to think about, well, how can we build off of this to do joint projects to affect everybody in a very constructive and positive way. So for me, the end goal, I think, is we are because of each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mary, can I put that one to you? <laughs> I mean, you know, to, to I come love like little, you guys are just, have such a beautiful <laughs> academic in the life. <laughs> I'm like, I grew up on a farm. And that's um, cool, too. I want to learn how to wrestle a pig, Mary. <laughs> Teach me how to shoot a duck, OK? I, I just want to dress that, a deer. Oh, I, I mean, I'll just say, Mary, I mean, to be honest, um, you and your colleagues at Soft Landing Missoula do extraordinary work. Yeah. We all know that. And we know it, particularly that it's difficult work, OK? Mm -hmm. Because what we're talking, you know, again, we can all agree or we can be like-minded people and agree. Uh, but a lot of your work isn't necessarily amongst the like-minded. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, you know, when you when you think about this kind of the way in which you engage people civilly and res respectfully, mm -hmm. what is it you're trying to achieve by, by doing that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously what we're trying to achieve at Soft Landing is a welcoming community, mm -hmm. you know, and, and a community that... Um, that that's that's the first thing we think about is how can we welcome and how can we help and i think missoula already lends itself very well to that um there's obviously a lot of work that we can do in many 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 places um you know but our overarching goal is that people can come here as refugees as immigrants and they can you know be afforded the same opportunity that anyone else has um, and so when I think of how dis civil discourse engages in that, I think it's a lot of, um, you know, we might think of it as a lot of external work, but to touch on what you guys are, 
are kind of going to too. It's it's a lot of internal work, yeah. mm -hmm. right? It's a lot of being able to acknowledge places in your gaps in your own knowledge, gaps in your own propensities. Um, obviously, your privilege. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, like why you, you know, why you came to this work and and figuring all of those hard spaces out within mm -hmm. yourself first so that you can then take that message to people that trust you and respect you and believe in what you're doing and help them also be reflective in those spaces. Um, you know, there's a lot of well-meaning actions and well-meaning individuals that miss the mark. Um, and mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I, I think the goal of creating a welcoming community is a little bit deeper than just how do I say hello? Mm -hmm, how do right. I give a smile? Mm -hmm. um, but really being able to reflect and, and be introspective on those moments in your life where I, I mean, I'm sure that we've all had them. Mm -hmm. I've had these moments where I'm like meeting face to face with someone and um, I'm so surprised by just my innate thought that comes into my mind mm -hmm. that's so far off base and so far off who I want to be as a person. Um, it, it, and we have to be able to pause and reflect and accept those parts of ourselves so that we can then move past them. But anyway, I'm not sure that that answered no, your I, I, initial question. It does. And I really like what you say, Mary, because it does move the conversation a little bit past the perfunctory, let's all be nice to each other and mm -hmm. let's speak politely to the deeper elements of, you know, we have a community, we have issues, we are trying to work through these issues together as a community. And we don't always agree. You know, yeah. we, we sometimes mm -hmm. are, are in conflict. That's okay. That's normal. But where do you go from there and how do you do it? Civil dialogue being one way in which you do that. Jacqueline, I'd like to hear from you and the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center, the kinds of things that, you know, you are achieving, you hope to achieve mm -hmm. uh, through civil dialogue. Yeah, I'll give a quick example. We co-hosted or co-facilitated a community forum um, on the state of the LGBTQI plus um, with Andy um, from the West Indiana Community Center. And it was fantastic. We There were about 40 people that attended in person, uh, 10 or 15 that were virtually hybrid. Um, we had two county employees, two city council members, a parks and rep representative, Andy, who's the ED, um, so we had a couple community leaders in the nonprofit world, and it was really powerful. We were talking about there has been a lot of hate speech and graffiti um, along trails, and with Pride coming up, it's a huge concern um, that you know we're going to be inviting. I think Andy told me there are going to be seven thousand people, non missoulians who come for Pride, um, in addition to the to the folks that will be here for Pride. Um, I hope I didn't get that number wrong. Sometimes I just like say stats, and I'm like, well. I hope that one was right. I'll fact, I'll fact <laughs> check this That's why I wrote that with these ones down because I was like, I have to get these accurate. You're getting a text from yeah. Andy right uh, now. Jack, like, so why did you say that, Jack? We have an office of fact checkers who are going through this right now. But Mickey, why don't you just could push you ahead? Just text me, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it was really powerful. There were all of these great ideas that came out and a and beautiful dialogue. I mean. No, not everyone agreed. You know, you had the city council members who were talking about the current process for hate speech, graffiti removal, and most of the group, it that wasn't good enough, you know? And so the, I, the, the place of saying, okay, we understand that those are the challenges, and yet this is such a need in our community that how can we move beyond this and, and, and move forward? And to be honest, I think it requires creativity um, and, and, community cohesiveness. You know, cohesiveness to me does not mean that we all have to agree or use the same pronouns or dress the same or vote the same, but cohesiveness to me is this commitment that we believe in something greater than just you and I, and we're gonna work to get there, even if it's not easy. Um, and I think that's what, you know, this community forum and, and it, that's a success of civil dialogue is when you get to that place where now you have all of these different facets of the local government and and community leadership and community members working together to improve a situation that will have a positive impact for so many more people than just those 40. Um, I think that that's that's 
you know, and, and I hope that the Peace Center, we did a community forum on, on Ukraine and the invasion. Um, I hope we continue with that. I would really like to do um, a targeted community forum every other month, hosted at the Peace Center with a different topic, different community leaders, um, because it, it was really successful. Um, and we got a lot done in an hour and a half of just conversation mm -hmm. and sharing ideas. So shifting gears here a little bit, um, Again, back to this idea that um, general agreement. I think we're, we're, you know we we often are nodding and saying yes. You know we, we all agree um, that you know we should be respectful and civil. Um, but for you who are really doing this day in and day out in the community, the question is: Is there any limit to civility? Are there um, times? Are there situations that you might share that where you'd say? Look, um, this can only go so far. Being nice and respectful, understanding, uh, has to stop at a certain point, or, or maybe it doesn't. But mm -hmm. I'd just be interested to mm -hmm. hear your views if there is something. So, Robert, how about over to you? Yeah, it's a tricky question, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Um, I'll go last. <laughs> it's going around this way. Get yourself ready. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, limits to civility. You know, I. I think that in many ways, uh, I think especially, you know, going back to what you said, Mary, about privilege, mm -hmm. I think that especially if, if you recognize that you have privilege because of your makeup and who you are, I think that uh, one of the most important things we can do is to ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, and like, as you said, not try and beat somebody into submission with our points of view. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, Chris, you said that. And so I guess for me, the limits of civility, I, I think that it's important to create safe spaces where people can share what they're feeling and what they're thinking and try to remove judgment from that. And that's what we've been doing at, at, at the brewery for seven years now. My wife, Fernanda, curates so many different, um, uh, oftentimes controversial talks. We pick, we pick the elements of our society that are those red button issues and we bring in people who will talk about those issues to oftentimes a packed tap room because people are interested to see what are people thinking about these different issues, whether it's immigration or refugees in the community or violence against women. Um, and I think what's important is uh, going back to that example from the Philippines, I think that it's important to give people safe space to be able to share what's going on inside of them and then to ask the questions, why do you think that way? to pull back the layers. And so even if somebody comes out and says something that could be very racist or misogynistic, to be able to take a, take a breath and say, why do you think that way? And oftentimes you'll be able to get the story behind that. And again, I, I, think, I think that we, we confuse in our society that by understanding someone, we're legitimizing what right. they're saying. Mm, and point. I think those are very different things. And to be able to say, okay, I understand why you think that way. I, I don't agree with that, but I understand why you feel that way. And I'd like to hear more about that. And I, what I found in my own professional experiences and for many of the times at the brewery is, when you start to hear the human story behind that, at least you start to see the complexity behind the thought process. And I think that that's what we need more of in our society is to be able to complexify these issues and complexify the human being behind these issues. Because I think we're, we're getting more and more quick to judge people based on one thing they say or one thing they did. Mm -hmm. And I think there's always more of a story there. Mm -hmm. But we have to be able to take a breath and be patient and let that human story come forward so that we can actually start to identify the areas that are not just shadows and darkness, right? That there's yin and yang. There's always light in the darkness and always darkness in the light. And so to be able to understand that way, I think it opens doors for, for deeper understanding, which then can become more mm. of this cohesiveness that you're, that, that, that you're talking about. I think without the complexity, there is no co cohesiveness. And um, so, yeah, I guess that's. Well, I think Robert, you really hit on something. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take what you said before going to Jay. I'm gonna just just gonna. I'm not twisting it, but it's it's, it's really rich. It's really rich what you said because I don't know if this is a devil's advocate point, but let me just put it out there. Yeah. The idea of legitimizing mm -hmm. something. Um, oftentimes, when people are talking civil dialogue, um, they they move to issues within our society and our communities. Uh, which are the most difficult racism inequality and and um and there are those 
whom we may have an opinion that that person or that place is a racist place. That might be a, an opinion that we share. And we worry that if we bring them into this dialogue, you said legitimizing, or people often call it a moral equivalency. Like, um, even mm -hmm. though you espouse hateful ideas, we are going to allow you into an equal space. And people worry about that. And so you, you've brought a really interesting point here, Robert. So, so I just, I'm going to just kind of nudge that one a little bit and just ask you, you know, what, what you think. It, it, it's still the same, it's the same question, yeah. but, you know, maybe picking up a little bit on that theme. This was the hardest question to prepare for, uh, without a doubt. When I saw it, I was like, ooh, yikes, Jacqueline, be careful what you say, be careful what you say. Um, because quite frankly, and if you've met me previously, this probably won't shock you, but if you haven't met me, maybe it will. Um, there are times when I do um, feel like physically protecting myself is important. And that can be emotionally, that could be spiritually, that could be physically, like there are times when boundaries need to get set. And there the ways in which boundaries are perceived by people who disagree with you or who don't want to allow you that space for a boundary will then require me to kind of like, you know, like I kickbox, what's up, you know, and, and it's, and I'm, and I'm not really doing that. Like I've never, like, you know, maybe I've said that once in my life, but like, you know, it, that's kind of like, I, I, I have to, I've learned that with the violences that I, that I've faced with the violences that I've heard, there is this bit of, self-protection and also protection of marginalized communities that feels really core and central into who I am. So when I'm sitting in a group talking about anti-racism and there is a white woman who says something that I know hurts the non-white people in the group who I'm friends with, I get a little heated. I get a little protective and not that that person doesn't have every right to believe that what they say is true and i'm and i know it's you know it's their conditioning it's their experiences it's their historical context that's bringing them to this place and and i do think it's an opportunity for learning it just needs to be mutual if that person is going to sit around the table and have a chat about anti-racism and they're white and they say something harmful it's really important for that person to be able to talk about what they said was just harmful to hear, to hear the perspectives of the people who they harm. And I find that specifically in privileged white groups in Missoula, uh, that's really hard for people. And, and, and I, I, I've only ever lived in California in the States for 10 years. I spent my time abroad in the global South, mainly for Europe for a bit of time too. And there, there is this thing that happens in this community and it's, and it's really challenging to not feel defensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I know that that's like this personal piece, but I also think that the conversation mm -hmm. needs to be pushed that yes, everyone is invited to the table. And also it is all of our responsibilities to learn really interesting point that yeah. one. Yeah. You know, and, and people might see that as uncivil. Right. People might think yeah, I'm being right. aggressive. Uh -huh. Maybe I am. Maybe. Oh, interesting. Intellectually. So, so <laughs> Mary, over to you. Limits of civility. Is there, is there a time when what we're doing is legitimizing the thing that we're trying to not have in our community? Yeah, this one is, this one is really hard. And, and I agree, like, obviously the hard line is safety right? Whether right. that's physical safety or emotional safety. Um, but I think also I'm, a, I am afforded a very different uh, threshold on that than other folks are, you know? And so, you know, returning to Robert's thoughts around complexity, we're all afforded these different thresholds mm -hmm. on what is the limit of civility. And, stepping into a space that's uncomfortable because I can be in that space without judgment because of the color of my skin or my background or whatever is important 
to do. Um, and I, you know, I don't really know necessarily know how to articulate it very well, but um, obviously, no, uh, you know, but it's just, mm -hmm. it, there's just different, there's, I am allowed different conversation than other people. And I think that, that, you know, as a white woman, I have to acknowledge that and I have to um, be able to be in that uncomfortable space, acknowledging that other people, this isn't a safe space for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if we had more time, I would love to get into that because Mary, no, I'm, you're, you're talking about your previous comment too about knowing yourself and the internal aspect mm -hmm. of all of this, which oftentimes we think it's external constantly, but it's a it's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, there's never any never any time where I'm like, oh well, you should just be able to talk nice to people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> some people's experience yeah. in the world has not lent them the privilege to be in that right. space yeah. in the way that I can be in that space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well yeah. put, well so. put. Mm -hmm. So we we have to wrap up here. Uh, I'm gonna just one last question, thirty seconds. This is your sound bite. We have a lot of people watching here <laughs> from the nonprofit community, oh, from our yeah. community. So um, you know any advice that you would give them in 30 seconds on you know civil dialogue in your life in your work in your community how do you do it why do you do it when do you do it mary pool um my advice is it starts here not there um and that one exercise that we did this past year that was incredibly helpful um is you know we went through our mission vision values and it was really the first time that we had sat down and really chewed on our values and i think even as an individual sitting down doing work identifying what your values are in the world and what piece you bring to it is the most important excellent mm. advice jacqueline uh, my two favorite things when i think about civil dialogue is step up and step back um this is mainly for myself is that you know stepping up is if you don't find yourself speaking in those conversations or sharing um and you feel comfortable to do that more and if you find yourself talking a lot like i'm sure at least some of us in this conversation <laughs> do i'm sure robert would identify <laughs> maybe all four of us um to step back to to listen right. more and and the second piece would be um listen to hear don't listen to respond mm. yeah, good point Thanks. and i'm listening to understand to hear you not to yeah. jump with my point right excellent robert you know, I think uh, on increasing levels over the last seven years since I've been here, I've heard people say more and more, you can't talk to them. Yeah. Uh, and I think that as a society, we're digging ourselves into our own foxholes based on our own value systems and our own perceptions of what we believe is right and wrong. And I think that, you know, I think that people think that empathy is something that we come into the world with. It's mm -hmm. not. Sympathy is something we come into the world with. We can easily relate to people when they have the same human experience as ourselves. But empathy really requires, you know, the Atticus Finch of getting underneath somebody's skin and walking around for a while. And I think that the more we can do that, especially with people who have different value systems and perceptions and beliefs than ourselves, that's where I think we can build a society where we can come together. And so, you know, for me, I would just say, I really piggyback on what both of you have said, but honestly, it's like, take time to listen, take time to be underneath the skin of the other persons. And I think have that be the starting point for potential civil dialogue, not the preconceived judgments that you come into the space with. Thank you so much. A fascinating discussion. You know, maybe we'll just hang out. We'll open Robert's beers and we'll continue on. Um, but let me just say a sincere thanks to Mary Poole from South Lining, Missoula, Jacqueline Flewellen from the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center, and Robert Rivers from Imagination Brewing. Um, three nonprofit leaders, our community leaders, who shared their views on civil dialogue. Uh, let's also thank the Missoula Community Foundation mm -hmm. and ask everybody who's watching this, get out there for Missoula Gives. Here are some great organizations. There are so many more in our community. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye.